Hello class, and today we'll spend some time talking about the tongue, the functions of the tongue, and the muscles of the tongue. So what are the functions of the tongue? Phonation, mastication, deglutition, and gustation. These are a lot of fancy words, so let's break them down. What do they mean? <clears throat> so phonation is speech, and the intrinsic or inside muscles of the tongue enable the shaping of the tongue which facilitates speech. Mastication is chewing. The tongue is an important accessory organ in the digestive system. The tongue is used for crushing food against the hard palate during mastication and manipulation of food for softening prior to swallowing. In the dorsal surface or the upper surface of the tongue is keratinized. So consequently, the tongue can be used to grind food against the hard palate without damaging the tongue or irritating the tongue. Deglutition is swallowing. And swallowing is a complex mechanism using both skeletal muscle, the tongue, and the smooth muscle of the pharynx and esophagus. The autonomic nervous system coordinates this process in the pharyngeal and esophageal phases. So swallowing is partly voluntary and also it has an involuntary component that is controlled by our autonomic nervous system. And gustation is taste. Um, so we have distinct types of taste receptors that we'll talk about a little bit later in this PowerPoint that are located on the tongue. And last but not least, I haven't written it here, but we also need to understand that one of the functions of the tongue is also with intimacy, physical intimacy, um, and it also has a role in sexuality. So here we are looking at the tongue dorsum. So we're, it's a superior view of the tongue. It's the view that you have when you stick your tongue out at yourself in the mirror. And the tongue can be separated into three distinct sections. The apex, which is just a fancy word for tip. So that's this portion right here. The very tip of our tongue is the apex. And then the body, which is the anterior two-thirds. This makes up the bulk of the tongue, and this is what's visible by simple inspection. When you look in the mirror and you stick out your tongue, you can see that anterior two-thirds of the body of the tongue. And then there's also a posterior third of the tongue, which is located in our pharynx, and that is called the root of the tongue or the base of the tongue. So we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at the body of the tongue, the anterior two-thirds. Sometimes it's also called the oral portion, and that makes sort of sense, doesn't it? Because that's kind of located in our oral cavity, and that's the anterior two-thirds. And the tongue consists of symmetric halves, a right and a left side. And they're divided from each other by a median septum. You can't see the septum. It's a deep tendinous band located within the midline. What you can see is the median lingual sulcus because the median septum corresponds with the median lingual sulcus, which is a median depression on the tongue's dorsal surface. So if you can imagine, the median septum is down deep in here and it's a tendinous band and it's kind of pulling in the both sides creating this median lingual sulcus and sulcus is kind of like a depression like a pocket right we talk about the sulcus with the gingiva and median is middle and lingual means tongue the other part of the body of the tongue contains a lot of these papillae papillae is plural for papilla, which is singular. So the papillae, the foliate, filiform, fungiform, and circumvallate are all located here in the body of the tongue. So let's take a closer look at these papillae. First we'll look at the filiform. And where, are this, where is it pointing here? Look at this. So the filiform papillae are pointed right here 
And these are carotenized, which is good, so our tongue doesn't get irritated when we're chewing. So it serves to protect the tongue. The filiform are our most numerous papillae. They don't contain taste buds, so they don't have anything to do with how we sense or taste food. Filiform papillae can become elongated, and we'll look at pictures of this. And when they become longer, they like get stretched out, they start to look like hair on the tongue. And if you see a patient with this, it's actually called hairy tongue when the papillae have become, these filiform papillae have become elongated. And the filiform papillae give the tongue sort of a velvety appearance. And the next papillae we'll look at are the fungi form. So let's look here. Okay, the fungi form, they're pointing here, here, and here. And there are fewer fungi form, but these contain taste buds. So now let's look at the fungi form. They are, they are fewer fungiform than filiform on the tongue, but they are larger than the filiform, and they contain taste buds. They can appear as sort of red bumps scattered around the tongue. So the next time when you're in preclinic, when you're doing an IOE, look for those scattered red bumps on the dorsum or the dorsal surface of the tongue. And these are our fungiform papillae. The other thing that the fungi form papillae contain are von Ebner glands. So what are von Ebner glands? They're nothing more than accessory or minor salivary glands, but they also are important in fat digestion because they secrete an enzyme called lipid lipase. And whenever you see A-S-E at the end of a word, think enzyme. So these von Ebner glands that are located within our fungiform papillae secrete lipid lipase, which is that enzyme that begins fat digestion in our mouth. Foliate papillae. Now these are in a different place. So we can see the filiform and fungiform are right located here on the dorsum of the tongue. They're on the top surface of the tongue. But the folate papillae are on our lateral borders. So you're going to have to pull the tongue out with a damp two by two to look and actually visualize these foliate papillae. And they appear as folds of tissue in the lateral border, way in the back in the posterior. And these also contain taste buds. And then last but not least are our circumvallate. Sometimes they're just called the vallate papillae. And we have about eight to 12 of these and they are anterior to something called the sulcus terminalis or the terminal sulcus. And the terminal sulcus is a V-shaped line which basically separates the anterior two-thirds body of the tongue from the posterior one-third root of the tongue. So if these are our circumvallate, they'll be about eight to twelve and they'll be in a V-shape here just anterior to something called the terminal sulcus or sulcus terminalis, you can call it either one, which is separating the body of the tongue from the base of the tongue. And the circumvallate papillae are just anterior to that. And these also include glands of von Ebner, those minor serous salivary glands, accessory salivary glands, which also secrete that lipid lipase, that enzyme that starts to digest fat. Okay, so here on the tongue, we're seeing that terminal sulcus, this green line right here. It's V-shaped, and it's essentially separating the body of the tongue from the root or the base of the tongue. And right in the center is something called the foramen cecum. And the foramen cecum is the center, the point of the sulcus terminalis, and it's the site of the embryonic origin of the thyroid gland. So when you're an embryo and everything is sort of coming together and joining, parts of the embryonic thyroid gland pass through this hole as it descends into our throat. So it's just sort of a, 
an embryonic remnant of the thyroid gland passing down through it. So that's called the foramen cecum. Moving backwards here, we're moving towards the posterior. So let's look at the posterior third, the root or the base. And because the body of the tongue was called the oral portion, the root or base of the tongue is known as the pharyngeal portion. And that kind of makes sense because it's in our pharynx. So it's fixed to the hyoid bone, the soft palate, the pharynx, and the epiglottis. And this contains the lingual tonsils, which are right here near the folate papillae. So you're probably familiar with these tonsils back here when you say, ah, and you can see the tonsils between the anterior and posterior fossas. So let's look, what are the lingual tonsils? So the lingual tonsils, they are part of the immune system, just like our palatine tonsils. So they're knob-like masses of lymphoid tissue, and they provide defense mechanism for infection. And the center is called a tonsillar crypt. It's like a little hole. And it can become, these lingual tonsils can become red and enlarged during infection. And they cover the surface of, so right back here, we can see the lingual tonsils covering the surface of the root of the tongue. Now let's look at some conditions of the tongue dorsum. Oh, so look at this, hairy tongue. This in particular is black hairy tongue because of its color. And this is due to the overgrowth of the filiform papillae. Food and pigments can become trapped and actually discolor the papillae. That's why it has this black appearance. And it can also be caused by some medication, such as if you <clears throat> take a lot of Pepto-Bismol, that can also kind of turn these, these elongated filiform papillae black. So known predisposing factors include smoking, excessive coffee or black tea consumption, poor oral hygiene, trigeminal neuralgia, which is pain in the trigeminal nerve. If you're generally debilitated, if you're very, very sick, um, xerostomia, which is dry mouth, and also various medication use. Now this is geographic tongue, completely 100% benign. And it's due to a loss of the epithelial covering of the filiform papillae. And you end up with these red, smooth, shiny areas on the body of the tongue that can actually move around. They change size, shape, and location. It's common. It affects about 2 to 3% of the general population. In the name, geographic tongue, when you think of geography, you think about different places on the map. And the name comes from sort of like the map-like appearance of the tongue and also because it moves around. The cause is unknown. It does not represent oral cancer and there's no cure. Uncommonly, but sometimes, geographic tongue can cause like a burning sensation on the, on the tongue itself. And various treatments have been described, um, but they have not been very effective. Geographic tongue is also known by the fancy term benign. So that sounds good, right? Migratory, I think about birds migrating, so it moves around. Glossitis, gloss means tongue. Itis is inflammation. So it's a benign moving inflammation of the tongue. Benign migratory glossitis is the same thing as geographic tongue. Now this is a fissured tongue or furrowed tongue. And these grooves themselves tend to get deeper and more prominent with age. Half the time, the patient will also have geographic tongue. So we differentiate fissured versus furrowed tongue this way. If there's an ulceration at the base, so if you take this 
fissure and you sort of open it up and it's ulcerated, it's truly a fissure. Um, it's considered fissure tongue because it has necrotic debris. If you open this up, if you kind of take your fingers and pull it open a little bit and it's lined with epithelium, it's just a furrow. So there's no necrotic debris, there's no rotting debris in there. However, both of them, fissured and furrowed tongues, can you imagine having like those, like these furrows, like pockets in your tongue and stuff can get jammed in there. So sometimes a patient can have really bad breath because like bacteria and other things have become trapped in these deep grooves. And other than brushing the tongue, there's no other treatment for it. And then strawberry tongue. So white strawberry tongue, and this kind of looks like white strawberry tongue, and there's no better thing to call it than strawberry tongue, because if you look at it, this kind of looks like a strawberry, doesn't it? So white strawberry tongue is seen in early scarlet fever and red strawberry tongue later on. Scarlet fever, so if you have strep throat when you were younger, or even now, hopefully you don't get strep throat, but if you have strep throat and it's not diagnosed and it goes for like a couple of days, it will turn into scarlet fever where you may get like sort of a rash on your cheeks and your tongue can turn and start to look like a strawberry. And you can start to get a rash over your body. So it's like a later term strep throat and it's known as scarlet fever. And if scarlet fever goes with no treatment at all, like you have no diagnosis, you don't get antibiotics to cure it, it can turn into rheumatic fever, which means that these bacteria that were causing the strep throat have now entered your bloodstream and they can damage your heart. Or your heart. But usually patients um, or people have a sore throat, they have a fever with strep throat. Sometimes strep throat can make you throw up. Um, in fact, my own daughter had a fever and was throwing up, and I thought, well, you know, it's a, it's a stomach bug, something. She was little. I had never heard of strawberry tongue in my life, and she stuck out her tongue, and I said, oh, her tongue looks like a strawberry. That's so weird, and I brought her to the doctor because her tongue looked like a strawberry. It was, I wish I had a picture of it, it was so many years ago. And the doctor brought in his associate and brought in a medical student because he's like, this is such a classic strawberry tongue. She has strep throat that has progressed to scarlet fever. She had a little bit of a rash on her trunk as well. Cured by antibiotics, she's fine. There are a couple of other um, conditions where you may see the strawberry tongue and that would be toxic shock syndrome and Kawasaki disease, which 